Welcome back to the Daily Dope Show. Um, this is a kind of a um, bonus clip, I guess you would call it. This isn't really a news clip, but this is a clip that, uh, I'll go ahead and play this in the background while I'm talking. I've been trying to make this clip for a little while. I didn't really know how I was going to formulate it and how I was going to lay it out or whatever. And basically I discovered I had this problem last year or this year, I should say, sorry. Earlier this year, I noticed something was going wrong in my garden. Um, <clears throat> then I started noticing it in every room, which is a bedroom outdoors in the garage. I have two flowering rooms in a garage. I have uh, a nursery in the house where basically clones, seed plants, stuff like that are grown into you know out of this out of the rooting phase <clears throat> and it wasn't I, I tried to figure out what I had for about six months didn't know what it was I was thinking it was some kind of deficiency um, and I knew that the, the deficiency had to be caused by something but I just couldn't figure it out um, I was doing preventative um, mold and bug spraying with green cure and captain jacks or spinosad so i basically wasn't really seeing any other problems other than what these guys were causing and then so finally one day i was uh it was sometime in september late september i believe i was looking at an outdoor cola i'm not sure if this is that video Yes, this is the one. This is the first video i seen. This is when I discovered. I'm going to pause it right there. See that guy right there in the middle? This is what i seen when I was looking at the trikes to see how far along they were. Because the plant was looking like it was just about done uh, flowering. And I didn't notice any deficiencies on this plant. Um, it was at the end of its life cycle, so it had the normal yellowing that uh, you know, lack of nitrogen in the soil still, and a few other deficiencies indicative of late in the season and color changes late, uh, indicative of cool temperatures at night and whatnot. <clears throat> I live in Michigan. So I wasn't aware that I had this bug problem. But when I looked at these trikes and seen these bugs, if you can look at this guy, they can crawl right between trikes, man. I mean, they are small. This is a microscope, by the way, that we're looking at, a USB microscope. Um, it's a really cheap one. <clears throat> it goes from uh, it goes from 50 to 100, I believe. Let's see if it's, it's kind of dark in here. I can't really see. Yeah, 50 to 100. <clears throat> so it's not that much magnification, but it is. You know, here's one right here. It's like pretty much. One tenth of a millimeter is how big that fully grown one is. Okay. <clears throat> um, when you start seeing the damage from these guys, this is what you're going to see first, pretty much guaranteed. I mean, you might see the what appears to be deficiencies on your lower leaves on the lower part of your plant. It's going to look like some scaling. It's going to look like the leaves have iron deficiencies it's going to look like possible magnesium deficiencies might even look like a calcium deficiency depending on how far along they've gotten um as far as spotting them like normal bugs the if, if you are familiar if you are an experienced grower and you are basically like if you're if you grow weed you should always be checking leaves you should look at leaves you should pull leaves right off the plant and examine examine them on a uh, magnifying glass or a loop to look for um eggs and larvae and bugs that you normally can see with your eyes but they don't really look like bugs until you look at them close or you see them moving <clears throat> like a spider mite or something then there's bigger bugs like aphids and whatnot that you can clearly see with the naked eye <clears throat> here looks like a um this is not a russet mite russet mites only have these front legs i guess so this is a broad mite maybe 
Um, it might be a russet mite. I'm, I'm still kind of minimum on my experience level with these bugs. Well, here's a good picture of a russet mite. As you can tell, it don't really have any back legs. And you've seen the video that I was rolling. They don't really have any back legs. Um, here's another one. <clears throat> we'll play for a minute while I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. So I was looking at that Mickey Kush outdoor bud, and I seen these guys crawling around, and I freaked out at first. And I'm like, well, what the hell are these? And so I looked into it, and I, I started reading about them. Uh, this video, there really isn't much much more to see, just more more of the same. And it's just scary to know that every minute that you're sitting there, these guys are in in your buds, they're on your leaves, they're in your stems, um, just re wreaking havoc. And what they're doing is they're eating the sap out of the plant. So the damage they do is, is unbelievable. Um, and be besides eating the sap from the plant, which saps your plants of energy and nutrients and stuff, but they're also, you know, in your plant's immune system really is the first thing to go. Um, then the extra energy that the plant has to spend just maintaining uh, branches and stems while these guys are tearing them up. They also inject poison back into the plant as they're eating the plant. So just something else to look out for. Uh, I thought this was kind of cool. If you look here, you can see the guy. He's about to come into focus. <clears throat> he got stuck on top of a trike. Let's see if we can get it there quicker. And yeah, there he is. <laughs> So that's how big they are right there, man. That is your trike. And this is the top of the trike. Here he is stuck to it. Belly up. Um, I don't think he's going to be able to get out of that. That's that's not going to be... Uh, that's it for that guy. So... Uh, well, where to begin? Um, let's, I've looked at a bunch of different articles. And I finally found one that basically didn't have too much, you know, an anecdotes written into it. It was just basically some straight up facts about these guys. Um, so here it is. Uh, here's the bad news. The bad news is if you grow cannabis, it's going to be hard to, to avoid these guys. These guys, the history is right now is that until about 2010, they were basically a rarity. And then as, as uh, you know, strains moving from state to state and people, the, the explosion, quite frankly, of the growing in the 2010 era, 2010 and beyond in different states uh, <clears throat> has helped the spread of them. I'm pretty sure that basically everywhere where you can grow weed legally, you're going to see these guys over the next year or two. All right. <clears throat> these guys are going to be what separates uh, dedicated growers from people that can't keep up with these bugs. They are, they're, the infestation of these guys will never go away. It's, you know, this is the kind of thing where people on message boards that I've read, and here's my list of research here. <laughs> you can go to several forums and message boards on the internet and each one of them will have a russet page, and all the russet pages are really big. Here's the IC uh, Inter International Canographic Magazine is like 60 pages deep at this point. Uh, and I feel like nobody's really gotten a grasp of how big of a problem this is until they get it. And the overall cannabis growing community still hasn't really acknowledged these guys as being... <clears throat> as big of an epidemic as they are. <laughs> and it's just like when you get them and it takes you like, like it took me six months. I've been growing for like 30 years, six months it took me to figure it out. And I guess I should have looked under the microscope a little bit sooner. So my fault for not being vigilant, I guess. Um, even when I thought I had something and I did look under the microscope, I was looking at, I was taking stems and dissecting them and looking at them under the microscope to see if I could find eggs. And I didn't really find any eggs, but, you know, because I was looking at stems, I was missing the russet mites who like to hang out on the soft tissue underneath leaves in the heart of the leaves where the flow of the sap is the, the hardest. 
Um, anywhere where there's sap, they love hanging out in flowers. Uh, so especially on cannabis plants, they love the flowers. So, you know, I wasn't looking there. I wasn't looking in those areas with the microscope and I was missing them. And even if I would have seen them, I would have been like that thing, you know, weed pest, what is that? You know, but if I would have seen what I seen on the bud that I just showed you that Mickey bud, I mean, there was literally a hundred of them on one little cola. So they're fucking bad, man. Uh, hemp and russet mites are part of the Eriophyde family of mites among the 100 or so plant-specific Eriophyde plant sp species, including gall, rust, and blister mites. The tomato-attacking microscopic russet mite is among the hardest to detect. Visible if then only in clusters, a single mite is too tiny by seen, to be seen by the human eye without magnification of 10 times and higher. And like I said, uh, at 10, they just kind of look like little maggots, little tiny, tiny things. <clears throat> you might even miss it if you're only at 10. You might miss if it's just one or two of them. I mean, if it's a whole pile of them, you're not going to miss them. Their near invisibility makes these mites a particular threat to become established in your garden before you realize it. And unlike spider mites, these voracious plant pests leave no webbings or other secretions when present. Visible damage to the plant is first indication of its presence, a damage often mistaken for mineral or other nutrient deficiencies. <clears throat> Seen through a lens, russet hemp mites are tapered, translucent, wedge-shaped cylinders that take on a yellow tint, especially in groups. Unlike most varieties of mites, Erophia include russet mites, including russet mites, have only two pair of legs. Like spider mites and others, they are increasing their range and are now commonplace, uh, common in places not previously seen. Because of their size, they're effectively dispersed by wind. Crop specific, they tend to multiply in areas of inten intensive growing, like the tomato raising uh, regions of Florida, and also do quite well indoors where warm, moist environments facilitate, facilitate rapid reproduction. In the past decade, they have spread from growers in California north into Oregon. And now they're in Michigan. <laughs> the life cycle. Females overwinter just uh, inside of stems of the plants they infest or where twigs are joined to stems. Translucent eggs nearly adult in size are laid in spring and go through two nymph stages, both a little different than the adult. The mites produce multiple overlapping generations through the course of a season, maturing in as little as eight days in warm, humid condition. Damage. Mites are sap suckers working at a cellular level. Damage typically appears first at the bottom of plants and moves upwards as they feed. Lower leaves begin to yellow and curl. The leaves drop and the stem discolors. As the plant's nourishment is sucked away, less vigorous green growth and flowering is observed. The tiny mites, in increasing numbers, spread to all parts of the plant. The mites seem particularly attracted to flower resins and will congregate in flowers and blossoms where they can effectively hide and do great damage. If left unchecked, the mites will eventually sap the entire plant. <clears throat> and what it does to buds is gross. It'll take a nice, fluffy, healthy bud that has nice, you know, thick, plump calyxes the first thing that goes is the hairs. They just get sucked right out. I don't know what happens to them. Um, on a plant with really tiny buds or new growth only, um, you'll just the new growth just keeps looking like someone chewed the, the top of it off. Uh, also with the uh, the buds, they when they suck all the sap out of it, they end up looking like little pine cones. I mean, it's like it's gross. Uh, russet mite control. The best control for both indoor and outdoor growers are preventative methods. Make sure you don't introduce mites into your grow space by bringing in infected, infected plants or contaminated potting soil that may carry female mites or eggs. Regular and close scrutiny of your plants, especially around the leaves nearest the soil line, if outdoors or anywhere a plant is flowering, is crucial to early detection. Uh, what might appear to be an iron or magnesium deficiency may... Um, may well be an infestation of russet mites. If in doubt, treat for mites as well as adjusting nutrient solutions or amending soil. 
finding and removing mites in their first generation, a period that can be short as a week under the tight under the right conditions, can short circuit a cascade of generations once the mites begin laying eggs. Many of the precautions and treatments used in spider mites also apply to this pest. Inspection of the plant is crucial during treatment. Look to see if damage has stopped. Remove all damaged leaves, stems, and even the entire plants that are like, you know, once you see the damage halfway up the plant is pretty much damaged from the bottom. In my experience, if you start seeing curled up leaves and damage at the top or evidence that there is uh, infestation at the top of your plant, and it's pre-flower, it's pretty much a done deal, man. The plant's not going to produce enough for it to even be worth it. Unless you, you know, there is ways to save plants that are looking like they are too far gone, but you start to wonder what is what is really worth it. And in my experience with these guys, what ended up happening was, you know, I lost a lot of strains. Um, I lost a couple of veg crops. It set me back a little bit at the end. When I finally discovered what I had, I was already in the in the process of losing entire crops and strains because, you know, I barely knew what I was dealing with. And then when I finally found out and I looked at what I had, quite a few of my plants were too far gone. And then when you look at these pictures, you'll see what I'm talking about. Like, obviously, that's not even a weed plant. <laughs> but, yeah, that's what you're starting to look like, shit like that. I didn't have a plant that looked that bad, but, you know, we were getting there. Um, this is like what I was just saying about how if you're, if you're from the bottom, from about halfway down the plant on down is dead. Like you'll have stems with brown stuff at the end of them. And if you see this at the top, this plant is a done deal. There's no saving it. And if you did, there wouldn't be much left of it. It wouldn't produce very good. Um, I don't know. I don't look like what we're dealing with um i had taken some pictures when i first figured out what i had and i was trying to take some pictures i didn't really get any i, I looked through what i took and although these aren't really helping me too much they are they are better than what i took <clears throat> all these pictures i'm showing you are definite russet mite damage and one of the things you always look for with plants especially uh, cannabis and here's some of that new growth I was telling you about where it just totally looks like that. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, whenever leaves are just slightly not shaped the way they should be for any reason, there's like an extra curve here. Or there's a, one blade is just like ridiculously small or big. That's because it's getting stressed out. All right. It could be from bugs or from mold or whatever. So you just, that's one of the first things you you, you look at <clears throat> when you see a leaf. None of these leaves look right. You look at a leaf and you're like, hmm, there's something just not right about that. Uh, the, the tops are too round. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of ways a leaf can look like something is wrong with it. And that's your first indicator. Once you go there, then you can figure out from there what you got. Troubleshooting plants is kind of scary, but you have to do it, man. It's like the main way you transfer from being just somebody that grows weed to somebody that really knows what you're doing is you got to actually figure out what's going wrong. Here's some more pictures of these guys. <clears throat> so this is all information that you should know. Um, I don't know if I really want to read it because... Like I said, I don't want to give you the antidotes from these guys, but I will go through here real quick and say a couple things about each one. All right. So potting medium and plants, getting stuff from other people. True. You know, always be careful what you're bringing into your garden. Problem is with these guys is they can come in on seeds. That's how I've heard them. I've heard of stories. <laughs> Anytime I say something about these guys is because I've heard it, read it on a message board, seen it somewhere. People are talking about it. Um, I've been studying this russet mite thing now for about two months, so I'm not saying I'm an expert by any means, but I, I'm pretty comfortable in the knowledge that I have that is helpful to somebody else, should be. Um, introducing beneficial nematodes or any other predatory mites. Um, now, that's a good idea. 
I do have to criticize it a little bit. Now you're going to be adjusting your environment. You should, if you're indoors, you should be able to adjust your environment to kind of make it so it's not exactly the best place for uh, russet mites to inhabit or breed. So that might not be good for predatory mites. Nematodes, you might, if you if you feel like you should flush your, or not flush, but uh, drench your soil with something that would, you know, kill the mites in the in the soil. That's up to you. Uh, I don't think that would be good for the nematodes. Just depends on what you're using, I guess. <clears throat> Insecticidal soaps have been known to kind of help out or keep you know pe keep the populations down. And a lot of people will tell you that. Oh yeah, just throw some Dawn and some water and spray your plants every day with it. I don't know if that's good or bad. I've never tried it. I don't swear by anything, and when I tell you how I handle these bugs, I don't swear by that either. I've only been doing it for about two and a half months or less. Um, neem oil. I, everybody that's older than me always talks about neem oil, and I've used it a few times. I don't, I don't like neem oil. I don't think neem oil is very effective against mites, in my opinion, because you have to spray a lot more than it's worth. To keep, it's just annoying um if you get them early and you always spray neem oil you're probably going to be all right but if you don't even spray your plants early with neem oil i think it stresses your plants out a little bit depending on how strong it is same with uh, parathrums um everybody acts like yeah spray it with parathrums get that'll take care of those mites man every time i've ever sprayed that shit on plants it stressed them out so i don't know anyway I'm not a big fan of anything on this list so far. Um, so it says use a 14 or larger. Yeah, that's true. It's, let me see here. I have a, um, yeah, here you go. Here's, here's what you, you got your USB microscopes. All right. Here's a loop, a $10 loop or, you know, less than $10. You can get like a 30 X loop with a light for, I don't know, 20 bucks. So there, that's a good option if you just want to, have something that you can always have with you to look at stuff in your garden <clears throat> digital microscopes um usb this is the one i bought right here 10 bucks can't beat it 500x um it comes on the screen about 640 by 480 um you know it's 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 reasonable you can get here's one for 850 um there's a little bit you can spend a little bit more and get better i like this one's uh platform better this one's basically just handheld you can you know the more you spend the better they get it's not really they're still the same one as i got for 10 bucks whatever man um bottom line my point here is is if you really want to look at stuff you can spend a few bucks and get a nice usb microscope like i got or buy a 20 dollar loop uh, don't hesitate to discard entire plants. I I can't stress enough that this is going to happen. If you didn't discover them on time and you got plants that are like just on just on the verge of being completely like done, because not only did the bugs suck the sap out of it, but the plant just simply can't handle no more of the poison being injected back into it, or just the sheer amount of mites that are just sapping the energy out of it but yeah they're they're looking to jump ship and if you don't throw that plant somewhere and light it on fire they're gonna go to the next plant um anytime you move stuff around in your grow rooms anything it might have mites on it or eggs or whatever so be very careful don't sweep or you're gonna kick dust up um and when i get into the spraying you, you basically can use the spray I'm going to talk about on all the equipment and surfaces and all that shit so you don't have to worry about bleaching. <clears throat> Indoors, don't bring uninspected plants from other gardens into your garden. I don't know how many times I got to tell people that. And even though I tell people that all the time, I'm guilty, man. I probably, who knows? I probably brought them russet mites into my own garden from some other clone that I got from somebody else. And I didn't even know about these things until I found out that's what I had. So that's, you know, another thing. If you've handled something like spider mites before, let me tell you, at the beginning, it looks like this is going to be a way bigger problem than spider mites. But to be honest, they're a little easier to live with in the long run than living with spider mites. 
Um, spider mites, you want to get rid of them if you get them. You want them to be gone forever. You don't want to have them lingering around and popping back in for an infestation once in a while because they will. As soon as you like let down your guard, boom, you're, you're going to get smoked out. These guys, it takes a little longer for these guys to totally take over your whole room you know like spider mark spider mites can do it pretty rapidly these guys they're really small and they don't move very far so well besides the wind so if you have a plant that has millions of them on it yeah your whole garden's gone man but if you keep up with them it's relatively easy to keep them keep their numbers down and keep the damage completely gone so you don't even see the damage <clears throat> Again, they, they mentioned predatory mites. Now they're talking about different chemicals. Um, not, not sure I would use any of this stuff again. <laughs> um, just because you don't have to. There's better things to use. And even on this article from Plant Natural Research, Planet Natural Research Center, I'm sure they're a store that sells a lot of stuff. Uh, but they say that the best product for russet mites is Nukem. <clears throat> and I don't know if that's true because I've only used a few uh, things on plants ever. And when I found out I had russet mites, I got to be honest, man, I had a shopping list because I didn't know about this. <clears throat> a couple things on the shopping list were enzyme-based products that I'm not going to go into because I don't know anything about them because they didn't they didn't have them at the, the store I went to. Um, they did have all the miticides and all the other chemicals that you can buy that has all these things in it right here. <clears throat> um, these are, generally speaking, the most common things that people growing weed have been known to use over the years. And... I don't know. I've never used any of it except for parathrins, which aren't really that big of a deal. I mean, parathrins are only banned on food-based crops in certain areas. I'm not sure of, of all areas. Um, <clears throat> see, the, the thing about here, this article is talking about cannabis pesticide use is not regulated. Um, <clears throat> although that's true and it's not true. Because, like, if you live in Oregon or Colorado, not sure about Washington, but a few other states that have medical marijuana programs have strict, strict lab, um, you know, rules about your uh, products passing lab. And when I say strict, I mean they're strict about how much stuff can, you know, residuals can be on your uh, final products. And they don't really like any residuals, to be honest. <clears throat> so I don't, re I don't really recommend using any of this shit on these mites because you're gonna have to spray a a lot. And if you discovered these late on in the game, you have them in your flowering room. Unless you want to throw away all those plants, you're pretty much gonna have to spray flowers. And I've never been a fan of spraying anything on flowers. Um, so we'll talk about that more in a second. Actually, I guess we're gonna go. We're gonna go right into the the nukem so what do what did i do well i went to the grow store <clears throat> and i had a list it had miticides and it had uh you know it had parathrins it had this miticide right here and that's an incesticide it had a fungicide and and miticide combo thing that's not even on this list but it's even it's probably not even safe to spray uh one week veg plants and a lot of these things i wouldn't recommend spraying on anything even a week before you throw it into flower because there will be residuals later on you know even whether you flush it or not so i'm always looking for the all natural organic shit and this is omri listed currently they're not omri listed with their newest product i think that they put out because they added one more ingredient um it's basically it. Uh, so when I when I tell people about Nukem, I recommend that you go to their FAQ on their website and read it. Everything you need to know is in that FAQ. I promise you. 
and it, it'll make you braver about using it too. Um, a couple of things I'll say about my use of it <clears throat> is I have done thing. I have done pretty much the following things with no problems. Uh, I've sprayed plants full strength with this three, sometimes four times a day. And I've sprayed uh, seed plants that are babies, seedlings, one inch tall seedlings that had might, russet mite damage. I've sprayed them with flying skulls two or three times a day. This stuff's called flying skulls nukem. Flying skull is the, the name of the brand. Nukem is the name of the product. <clears throat> People, have, you know, when I show people this, they look at the price and they look at the ingredients and they're like, what in the heck is this? You know, if you look at the ingredients, citric acid, uh, let's see, print is in here now. Yeah. what's the inert ingredients? This is like the emulsification process that you do to put all this together and you end up with this product. Um, citric acid it has less than it's got about a half of uh, or though no, that's a hundredth <laughs> half of a hundredth I don't know if I'm reading that right but five hundredths now the inert ingredients water yeast potassium salts of fatty acids sodium benzate potassium sorbate what are we making wine or something with citric acid <laughs> and people are always like why is it so expensive um, it really ain't. This stuff is concentrated, so four ounces makes a gallon of spray, and you can actually make it weaker than that. I've made it, I've sprayed uh, it at quarter strength, and it still kills bugs on contact. Um, bugs do not get immune to this. Eggs don't get immune to this. Uh, that's pretty much, I don't know what else to say about this product. Um, I'm not, I don't work for them, so I'm not saying that this is the only thing I know of. And this is the only thing that will work or whatever. I'm not, I'm not saying it works the best. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying this worked for me. And when I say that, here's what I mean. First thing I'm going to tell you, man, is you see these guys, you're not getting rid of them. They're not going away. I've read stories about greenhouses where they had um, worked on getting rid of them by uh, fumigating and spraying bleach on stuff. See, the russet mite eggs don't look a whole lot different than that. They don't have as many of the little dots on them, but they are really big like that. See, here's like a regular size mite, and then here's the egg. They're really comparable to that. They're like quite close to the same size. And they're really residual or re resist <laughs> resilient. There you go. There's my word. I'm having a trouble with words today. Sorry. Um, they're resilient. They can handle extreme temperatures and sprays of, you know, lots of sprays that kill the bugs and the larvae won't kill these eggs. Uh, flying skulls in the fact says that it, it neutralizes the eggs. Like the eggs won't hatch when sprayed with, with nucum. I mean, when you get an infestation of russet mites and it looks like that, you're in serious trouble. <laughs> uh, and if you spray, no matter where, no matter where you spray or how much you spray, it's super hard to get every bug or every egg. And however you got them is also worth looking into. You might get them again from the same method. You know, you might buy a clone from the same place that maybe their clone room is infested. You might get a you know your neighbor grows weed and they just blew in with the wind um you buy dirt it's bag dirt you think it's safe but for some reason the company that makes that dirt don't even realize that they have an infestation nearby where they're at and it's blown into their dirt so this stuff is these guys are everywhere man <clears throat> coast to coast now infesting grow rooms causing major damage this is one product I know that works. And what I did is, is I spray plants vigorously and very liberally with this stuff on quite a regular basis. All right. I knock the infestation down and I don't see damage. Like I, you know, like, like it got to the point where things were dying all around me. But uh, basically, 
yeah, you just go to town with it. Um, actually, I do have a video of me spraying a plant, so let's watch that real quick. Notice the sprayer is just a wand sprayer. It's a one-gallon pump reservoir, hand pump. <clears throat> um, these are really effective for cannabis crops. You can get right in there. You can get to hard-to-reach places. You can. Um, it's adjustable, so you can adjust the spray to blast them pretty good. And yeah, you really need to get these plants saturated. Now you'll notice this plant is about five weeks into the flowering phase. Normally, I wouldn't recommend spraying anything, not even water on, on those buds. But I don't know what the magic is besides being a, a but like a, a miticide or just an insecticide, insecticide in general. Um, this is also a fungicide, so very helpful in fighting fungus, mold, whatever you want, powdery mildew. Since I've been using this, I have not seen any evidence of powdery mildew anywhere in my garden. Um, and again, spraying equipment and buckets and dirt, it, it's all, this. It, you can spray this everywhere. Notice my leaves are all perfect. I don't know what's going on there. <laughs> That's what happens when they're healthy. I mean, I was looking for russet mite damaged leaves to show you in my garden here, the garden that's on at this time, and I couldn't find anything. So you got to get thorough, and <clears throat> I ended up having to stake this plant because it's so saturated. Uh, see, I'm, I'm trying to get under the leaves, and then... Here's, here comes another attempt at that at the end. Yeah, here we go. You get get right under there and pull the leaves up so you can get right into the bottom. That's where they like to hide is in the heart of the of the of the leaf, like right in the middle part. So I'm talking about this area right here, on the bottom of the of the leaf and on the top of the leaf. Like, unlike spider mites, just like to hang out on the bottom mostly. These guys will hang out anywhere. And they usually like to hang out near uh, trikes. And the leaf trikes, they look like little sharp hairs. They'll hang out on those too. And then after you're done, you should definitely, whenever you spray something that has buds on them, um, shake it as much as you can. And in this case, like I said, I had to stake it. You're not going to see it here, but I also like tried to have the fan kind of blowing by it to try to draw the air away from it. I never like to blow a fan directly on a, a plant that has been sprayed for some reason. I don't know why. It's probably not a big deal. But that's about it for spraying. Um, like I said, I had to <laughs> I'd make an adjustment later on that. <clears throat> um, and... Finally, I'm going to just go to the last uh, part of this video, which, like I said, I, I'm not sure about any other products, so I'm not on here shilling for Nukem because I work for them or any of that kind of stuff. So just to prove that or whatever, I got I looked around and I found another product that looks like it might even be pretty similar to, if not the exact same ingredients, other than the fact that these guys definitely have a slight bit of isopropyl alcohol in their ingredient list as well. But I figured, you know, hey, these guys, it looks, it's comparable in price too. You look at the, the, the size of the bottle, like 40 bucks for an eight ounce bottle, but it takes less um, concentrate to make, you know, the, the one to two gallons or whatever it takes. It took four ounces to make one gallon on, on the Nukem. For this, it's two ounces to make one to four. So it looks like it's pretty much the same price. I did some math, and yeah, it's about the same price. And then it also had a handy video. Oh, no. Shoot. Um, green cleaner. Let me look that up real quick. I had that queued up. I'll go ahead and grab that then. I should just go right to YouTube. Here we go. All right. Yeah, this isn't too painful to watch, so let's just go ahead and watch this. 
Hi, Mike here with Sunlight Supply. As gardeners, we have all encountered aphids, white flies, and especially mites, specifically spider mites, russet mites, and broad mites in our gardens, both indoors and out. Luckily, there's a new product. Now listen, the, what I like about this video is this guy's gonna tell you exactly how it works on the different things, you know, like bugs and fungus and stuff. And this is important because basically I don't really know this stuff. I was kind of curious myself. And it also, like I said, because of the uh, the fact that the ingredients are so similar, if not the same, um, then the action is pretty much the same. But I have talked to growers, well, I specifically just one grower that I know in Oregon who had to get their, their uh, final flower testing done. And <clears throat> a bunch of their stuff got sent back from the lab because of powdery mildew, but they sprayed for uh, russet mites because russet mites, you'll notice them stay there after you cut the plant down. They'll still be alive. They'll be on the drying rack still eating the sap out of your buds. So you can spray after you cut them down with, with this. And there's no residuals that will test uh, over any acceptable levels of any chemical that the lab will kick you back on. So you can spray this after you cut it down and it'll still pass a lab test. And I'm pretty sure he's going to say the same thing about green cleaner. Aimed at controlling all of these pests as well as powdery mildew. This is Green Cleaner by Central Coast Garden Products. Green Cleaner is an all-natural pesticide, insecticide, fungicide, and miticide all rolled into one. It will quickly and efficiently <laughs> immobilize, suffocate, and destroy garden pests such as the aforementioned mites, aphids, and fungus gnats, as well as their eggs. So-called superbugs are created when mature adult pests are eliminated and their eggs are left behind to build an immunity to whichever product you're using. With Green Cleaner, there is no immunity, no superbugs, and no mercy. And I'm going to go ahead and say the same thing applies on that level with uh, Nukem. Uh, and even if you did use like a really light spraying of it, that's not going to create superbugs. The bugs that did get a little taste of it that didn't die or whatever... I don't know that they're not going to be immune to it either if you use a full strength next time. Green Cleaner works a couple of different ways. First, the soybean oil coats the bug, immobilizing and suffocating them. Then, the sodium lauryl sulfate acts as a surfactant, while the sulfates contained within actually clog the external pores on the body of the pest, further suffocating them. Next, the small amount of isopropyl alcohol used to make Green Cleaner quickly dehydrates the pest while also helping to evaporate the product from the plants, preventing any residual product on the plant. And finally, the citric acid prevents oxidation of essential oils on the plant, which contribute to smell, aroma, and flavor, and also acidifies the plant. Green Cleaner also works on powdery mildew in two different ways. First, it coats the powdery mildew, suppressing and limiting spore reproduction while also dehydrating the target. Then, it also alters surface pH, making the leaf surface uninhabitable for powdery mildew to live, and simultaneously killing the mildew spores with its antifungal properties. To use Green Cleaner, simply dilute one ounce per gallon of water for any foliar spray and coat all plant surfaces. Green Cleaner only works on pests and mildew that it comes in contact with, so we recommend applying a couple of days in succession to ensure. All right, that's all I got on that. And again, with Nukem, um, you know, using a weakened down version of it to do maintenance spraying is is not a big deal. It doesn't cost that much to do, as well as it also is definitely prevents any powdery mildew from ever showing up like all the plants will be completely healthy free of mold and fungus and you know meanwhile you're going to keep your population to a minimum of the russet mites which if uh, you know if someone figured out a way to um completely rid their garden of russet mites they're not going to know they're, you have to just assume that you always are going to have these around, all right? And when it comes to the marijuana growing, the greater cannabis world of growing cannabis, I think we're stuck with this problem, guys, all right? This is one that's it's not going away. And there's going to be a lot of inexperienced growers that see stuff like this. 
their plants end up like this. That's a tomato plant, but still. <laughs> um, these, these are the worst bugs there is for cannabis plants. Don't let anybody fool you. If you find out you have these, you, you got to take it seriously, man. Too many people I already have uh, talked to about these bugs do not take it seriously until they're wiped out. And I'm just telling you right now, man, be vigilant. Uh, that's all I got for this grow tip. Um, and in case you didn't know what I was talking about earlier, this grow tip video is, to, is a kind of a makeup for um, a couple of weekly podcasts that I did where I didn't have the grow tip at the end because the podcast was just so full of s stories that I didn't have the energy to do the grow tip at the end. And this grow tip's quite long anyway, so I figured I would make it its own video when I decided I was going to do this video about this uh, particular issue. And if you're on your way to becoming a master grower, I got to tell you, man, the main thing you do as a master grower is to make sure that your plants are healthy. That's it. And one of the main things you can do to make sure your plants are healthy is that they're not getting leached on by little guys like these. So be vigilant. Stay on top of it. And good luck battling the russet mites. <clears throat> they're quite... Uh, they're quite freaky, man. You're never going to see them with your eyes. So just because you can't see them with your eyes don't mean they're not destroying your plants. That's all I got. Have a good one.